Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 255 on Now You Know. As always, we are brought to you by our amazing Patreon patrons. Support creating independent news every week by heading over to patreon.com slash now you know, and there you'll find some awesome perks, including our book club. And we're also brought to you by BigBattery.com. No matter what you need to power, Big Battery can provide you with the latest battery tech at the best price per kilowatt hour, guaranteed. Their batteries are easily installed, require zero maintenance, and they're made right here in the U.S. Pick up yours today at BigBattery.com and use code now you know for 5% off at checkout. Hey, Jesse, you were here early this morning. What, you couldn't get to uh, sleep? Uh, no, actually, I got great sleep last night. Thanks to our sponsor, Birch. Birch Living is a premium mattress in a box company that makes mattresses and sleep products that are stylish, comfortable, and environmentally conscious. Their mattresses are made of organic wool and cotton, natural latex foam, and steel. Birch mattresses are handcrafted in the USA. Oh, so you got a new mattress. I mean, I remember when I bought a foam mattress years ago, I couldn't get to sleep on it for like a week because of that plastic smell. Well, here's the crazy thing. I opened my Birch mattress and it didn't smell like anything. I mean, like if you stuff your face into it, it smells faintly of like wool, but that's it. No disgusting off gas smell. I got a great night's sleep the very first night. So where'd you pick it up at? I didn't. It was delivered right to my door, shipped for free. Wait a minute, you got a mattress off the internet? What if you didn't like it? Well, there's a 100-night sleep trial. If you don't absolutely love it, Birch will pick it up and you'll get a full refund. But wait, how did you get a queen-size mattress up your tiny, twisty stairwell? It came in a box, all rolled up. It's very fun to watch it inflate. Wait, I thought you said it had steel pocket springs. How did it come deflated? It just did I, I don't know and and yeah i love the pocket springs pocket springs don't squeak yet they offer great support and they don't hold a grudge when you change sleeping positions in the middle of the night visit birchliving.com slash now you know to get 200 dollars off your birch mattress plus two free pillows i don't think i ever had a mattress made of wool yeah birch mattresses are organic free of harmful chemicals and ethically produced right here in the u.s that's great but what really matters to me is how comfortable the mattress is to sleep on I agree. I've been sleeping on it now for weeks, and I've been getting great sleep. The mattress is nice and firm, but with their plush organic mattress topper, I get support and comfort. Also, the springs literally make it easier to get out of bed in the morning. Wait, easier to get out of bed? Yeah, my previous foam mattress had a permanent crater worn into it. By the way, that mattress costs three times what the Birch costs. Yeah, and with our link, birchliving.com slash now you know, you're saving even more. And remember, if you get it and you don't like it, Birch will pick it up for free and give you a full refund. So you have nothing to lose. Visit birch.com slash now you know to get $200 off your Birch mattress plus two free pillows. All right, it started with the tweet as it usually does. This one last Tuesday from Tesla Tino. Funny how many people are now questioning why Tesla created their own proprietary charging connector and that it's not fair for other EVs. How about no support for Elon when he was advancing the technology? His team created a reliable way to charge the fleet. Deal with it. And then Elon responded, explaining, we created our own connector. There was no standard back then and Tesla was the only maker of long range electric cars, which is true. It's one fairly slim connector for both low and high power charging. But then the bombshell. That said, we're making our supercharger network open to other EVs later this year. And the Twitter sphere exploded and the questions started coming fast and furious. Aaron asked, Will it be open to other EVs in all countries or just specific ones? And Elon answered, Over time, all countries. Yeah, so then the questions and comments kept coming, but Elon was silent. So uh, lots of comments were coming in like this one from Lasse. He commented that many Tesla owners are worried if the supercharger network opens to other manufacturers, he said. This is how it looks like in Norway. The Tesla charger is almost full and there's a big line on the normal chargers. What will happen when everyone gets to charge at the Tesla chargers? And Sam Ward said what many of us are thinking. As much as I think it's nice that you're letting other EVs charge, I think it's a mistake. There's already enough congestion at superchargers. No other EV helped the Tesla market. So why should they get a piece of the pie anyway? And Tom Janus didn't put it as nicely. Wow, the biggest mistake in Tesla history. With one decision, you have destroyed your biggest USP. Selling my stock. Next car, VW eBuzz. Using the SUC. This decision is incredibly stupid. Kind of sad. Elon Musk. 
Yeah, so uh, I think we're going to be covering this on our in depth this week because it's a big story. Um, and there's, I think, pretty split. We should do a poll, actually. Uh, we did do a poll, and if you watch the end of the episode, you will get to see it. But yeah, stick around for that in depth. Hit the subscribe button, and then also hit the bell notification. So that way, on Friday, you'll get a notification when we talk all about this. All right, so Tesla owners online broke some new news. Breaking. Tesla sells Maxwell to UCAP power. Tesla kept the dry electrode IP. They weren't interested in the ultra capacitor stuff. And Elon confirmed. Ironic indeed, as I was at one point going to do my PhD at Stanford on high energy density capacitors for use in electric vehicles, but lithium ion has it covered. Even with no advances in lithium ion technology, it's possible to transition earth to sustainable energy. He said dry electrode is a key piece, one of the many pieces of the puzzle for lowering costs of lithium batteries. That said, it has required an immense amount of engineering to take Maxwell's proof of concept to high quality volume production, and we're still not quite done. So let's remind everyone who might not be up on mergers and acquisitions what we're talking about here. Remember that Tesla bought San Diego, California based Maxwell Technologies back in 2019 for $218 million. Yeah, Tesla got two important technologies from buying the company, their ultra capacitors and their dry electrode technology. At the time, we were pumped about both technologies. The dry electrode tech allowed lithium ion batteries to be made without wet slurry. That takes a lot of extra time and energy to dry. And the ultra capacitor, we thought, could be used to enhance regen braking and allow for faster acceleration, especially in things like the semi trucks. Well, it appears that Tesla has sold back the ultra capacitor part of Maxwell to UCAP Power. Yeah, UCAP Power said in a press release last week, UCAP Power Incorporated, a leading developer of ultra capacitor based power solutions, today announced it has completed the purchase of Maxwell Technologies Korea, the Korean based ultra capacitor business, as well as other related assets, including the Maxwell brand. Gordon Schenk, CEO of UCAP Power, said, We're thrilled to combine Maxwell Technologies Korea's ultracapacitor manufacturing capabilities and one of the largest patent and product portfolios in the industry with the growing family of products developed by UCAP Power. This combination creates a clear market leader in the wind turbines, reserve power, automotive transportation, microgrid application markets. Now, there was no disclosure on how much Tesla was paid for the ultracapacitor business. Now, I don't want to give up on ultracapacitors here. I mean, it is possible that ultracapacitors will make a comeback into the drivetrain, but it might be that Tesla decided not to vertically integrate them for the time being. Yeah, I mean, you got to keep in mind, Tesla clearly set out to buy Maxwell Technologies specifically for the dry electrode IP. Mm -hmm. They really wanted that to make uh, lithium ion batteries uh, better, cheaper, faster, all that good mm -hmm. stuff. The ultra capacitor stuff at the time we thought was like, well, it's Maxwell Technologies. They're known for their ultra capacitors. Right. So clearly this is going to be ultra capacitor stuff. And it turns out that it wasn't as far as we know. Now, interestingly, Tesla sold back the, you know, ultra capacitor stuff to previous owners of Maxwell Technology. Right. So they're kind of they sold it and now they're buying it back. And that's an important point because if you sell a company and you're like, yeah, we sold it, hands off, let's go to the Caribbean, then that means that like you really weren't that interested in the tech. But the fact that they're like, please give us back the tech, Elon, we want to work on it some more, right. shows that maybe Elon's like, hey, you know what? We won't vertically integrate right now, but we can come back and buy that tech later. Because honestly, it's not something that Tesla really wants on their books. You know, they're a very diverse company. They have energy products and car products and solar products. And, you know, they're exploding into different markets. But the ultra capacitors are kind of an already established business. If they have a bad quarter, why have them all mixed up in the mix and have people get confused and upset about the ultra capacitor business not doing well just by selling it? back to, you know, the Maxwell executives and saying, OK, go ahead, keep running your. Well, that's another good point. If you're not ready to use those ultra capacitors and Tesla's, that means that they can't ramp up production, whereas maybe there's some other companies they can start selling ultra capacitors to, which will then bring down the price. And then Elon can come back and go, oh, great. You've got it down to like a great price per kilowatt hour or whatever, however you measure ultra capacitors. Mm -hmm. uh, now's the time to put it into our vehicles. Right. And it's probably true that the technology just was not there to make an ultra capacitor to fit in a car that would you know, for the size and weight of it, do anything useful. Or the price wasn't there. That too. So Tesla semi truck is going, going into, into production. production. Is it though? What do you mean? I mean, we've been hearing th about this constantly that the you know reports that the semi truck is coming soon. Well, Electric has reported that, quote, sources familiar with the matter told Electric that the drive axle production line is ready and the general assembly line is going through its final debugging before starting production. And that's that's it. Well, yeah, that and all the other reports we've been hearing about the semi being produced by the end of the year. 
So are we going to be getting our truck soon? Our semi-truck order reservation? I hope so. I mean, at this point, it might even be delivered before the Rivian. All right, for the seventh time in seven months, Tesla has raised the prices of one variant of the Model Y and one variant of the Model 3. Okay, so first let's get into the exact prices and models. The Model Y long range dual motor went up by $1,000 from $52,990 to $53,990. The Model Y went up $4,000 just this year. Uh, the Model Y performance stayed the same at $60,990. The Model 3 long range all wheel drive price also went up $1,000 from $48,990 to $49,990. The standard range plus stayed the same at $39,990 and the performance performance remains unchanged at 56,990. So the big question is, why does Tesla keep raising the price? I want to buy this car and it keeps going up in price. I'm sad. What's what's the deal? I think it's two things. I think it's demand and it's probably some supply price increases. I mean, there's lots of uh, problems in the supply chain right now. You probably have to pay more if you want to get in line. So I'm guessing that things like chips have gone up. Mm -hmm. But demand, I think, is the big story here. If they were having trouble selling these vehicles, there's no way you'd be raising the price this often and by this much. That's true. And I mean, even if they aren't raising it for demand, even if it's just for, you know, supply chain stuff or, regard, you know, whatever, it's a great test to test out demand. Yeah. Um, you know, last quarter they sold more Model Ys than they ever had before and the Model Y was at a higher price than it had ever been before and it keeps going up. Yeah, I mean, estimated delivery right now is 10 to 16 weeks. So, I mean, they're selling them as fast as they can make them and they aren't even making them fast enough. Right. All right, so Elon tweeted out, also the full self-driving interface renders across the whole display and it is incredible. The yoke enables an unobstructed view of the screen. And then Fredster asked, any chance of a normal steering wheel option? And Elon said, no, no steering wheel for you. We had kind of conjectured, we had thought that like maybe you could get a normal steering wheel on the Model S because we had seen some like early prototypes that had, you know, normal Model S steering wheels. And we were like, oh, good. He's forcing us all into the future. Do you realize that, folks? We're all going kicking and screaming every time that Tesla comes up with something, we fight back. All right. The latest being something we're going to talk about soon with the smart shifter. Mm -hmm. It's always something that we're like, do we really need that? I don't think I want it. And then Elon's like, that's what you're getting. And for a while, we're all like, I think. I want the old thing back. Mm. And then we get the new thing and we're like, I like the new thing. <laughs> I mean, you got to remember, uh, who is it? Uh, Henry Ford. And he's like, uh, you know, Ford customers can buy any color Ford they want so long as it's black. Or also Henry Ford said, if you ask customers what they want, they'll just tell you they want a faster horse. It's, it's true. <laughs> we don't know what we want. We really do rely on people with vision to show us what we need. Um, and then we either gravitate to that product or we don't. Right. I mean, you remember, when was it? Like back in the early 2000s, it was like, well, I can't live without a keyboard on my phone. Right. Well, how could I possibly and, live without a keyboard? And I was one of those people. Right. I was like, I'm not buying that phone that doesn't have a keyboard. Right. And, and you were like, you don't need a you keyboard. You don't need a keyboard. Right. Um, and this goes to politicians. It also, go, I mean, there's so many politicians who just do polls. Like, well, let's see what people want. And that's the direction I'll go. Right. I think what we're all really wanting deep, deep down is someone to go in a direction and to follow them, not to be like, well, I'll tell them where I want to go. A leader. You it, want a, a leader. That's what a leader does. And it's not always popular in the beginning right. sometimes when leaders do stuff we're like why did you do that and then later you know usually when they're dead uh we we all go they were amazing right and it's the same thing with the cyber truck yeah elon didn't make like oh it looks like a ford f-150 he was like hey we're gonna make it out of folded stainless steel let's make it bulletproof. nobody predicted the what that looked like no. right it came out we're all like mm, I, don't, I, don't I don't know i don't know right now there's a million of us waiting to get our hands on it that's exactly what we're talking about here he's a visionary and I mean, Tesla Time News is sponsored by the Cybertruck Owners Club. I really think you should head over there, talk about this, because it's like such an important thing. So check out the Cybertruck Owners Club for Cybertruck news, discussions, and community for Cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners. You'll also find a crowdsourced reservation tracker that you can update so that way you can find your place in line for the Cybertruck. And don't forget, there's the 3D configurator allowing you to visualize your Cybertruck in any color, wrap, and logo, both on screen and in augmented reality. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about the impressive of efficiency of the Lightyear One, that oh, yeah. solar-powered car. It had an impressive range of 710 kilometers on just 60 kilowatt hours of battery and sunlight. To infinity and beyond! But we remarked how we were nervous that Lightyear hadn't even picked a manufacturer yet. Well, it appears that they must have been listening because this week, Lightyear has announced a letter of intent with contract manufacturer Valmet Automotive to produce the Lightyear One. 
This is a year ahead of the summer 2022 limited production run of the Lightyear One. That means that Lightyear One will probably be produced at Valmet's vehicle manufacturing plant in Usikaupunki, Finland. Although nothing has been definitively announced so far, there's still a chance that it could be produced closer to Lightyear in the Netherlands. I hope it's produced at Usi Kaupunki, Finland, because I just want to keep saying that word. That's a cool word. All right. We've been reporting on Chevy Bolt fires for weeks, begging GM to handle this problem properly. And GM finally did. They have officially recalled the 2017 to 2019 Chevy Bolts due to battery fires. Elon tweeted out, large pouch cells undergo significant volumetric changes at high state of charge. Even so, fire risk is probably less than gasoline cars. There are over 200,000 combustion engine fires every year in the U.S. alone. It's literally in the name. Really well tweeted. Yeah, it's I like a slap. And a congratulations <laughs> kind of in the same suite. He's good at that. So it looks like GM has finally realized that software that limits full charging of the Bolt battery isn't going to fix this problem. And so on Friday, they announced recall N21234380, in which they say they will replace defective batteries. While Bolt customers wait, they should not charge their batteries more than 90% and not deplete them lower than 70 miles of remaining charge. Hang on, hang on. Uh... Doesn't that effectively lower the actual range of the car? Uh, yes. Yes, by by a significant margin. Well, let's just do the math. So if you can't charge it up to full and you can't draw it down below 70 miles, that's only 162 miles of range. Assuming you don't have any battery degradation. Oh, right. So it's probably even less. Right. So, I mean, you now have basically a car that has, I don't know, like 60% of the range of what you bought it. Well, and it's not only like, oh, I'm getting low. It's like... I have to make sure that I don't get to yeah. 70 miles, otherwise my car might catch on fire. So the affected bolts have battery cells made at the LG plant in Ochang, South Korea. The defective batteries have two manufacturing defects. Two. Separate. Yeah, so two simultaneous ones. It's not in every battery, and that's the weird part. I think if you read between the lines on this recall, GM now has figured out that certain batches have both defects. And if you have that battery, um, they're either going to replace individual modules or entire packs, depending on how many cells are defective. So let's say you had one bad cell. They'll probably go in and take that whole module out and replace with the new module because that's cheaper. Whereas if you had cells all throughout you know, the pack, they'll probably just take out the whole pack. So I just want to get this straight. The, the 2017 through 2019 Chevy Bolts now are 162 mile range cars. Mm -hmm. The resale value on them must have dropped overnight. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it is if people weren't already worried about the battery fires. Yeah. Now, maybe this is a fix, although we have seen people have battery fires where they weren't charging above 90 percent. No, and that's a, that's a really good point. It's not like if you follow these rules, you're safe. The batteries are so unstable that basically you're just helping your chances by not doing that. You're still there was a guy who only charged to 70 percent and his car caught on fire. So right. it's not a guarantee. And this is what frustrates me about GM. They could have solved this problem earlier, way earlier. Um, it goes back to, uh, you know, if you ever watch Fight Club, you know, and the guy's job is to, like, do the analysis of, like, hmm, should we uh, fix the problem or should we let people suffer? I think GM had a guy doing that. And it was just until we had more battery fires and people got upset that they actually wanted to start to solve the problem. Yeah. In the 80s, uh, you saw this new brand of management that came along that came out of Harvard Business Management School. And the idea was, yeah, to count the each widget to count each uh, penny and instead of trying to be a trustworthy company and to have a value in your reputation it all came down to just counting pennies and that mentality has has just gone on for decades mm -hmm. and it's still there at the big companies like gm where they're like well it'd be cheaper if we just let a few cars burn no it would be better for your brand and your reputation of all evs if you took care of the problem in the beginning so that you didn't hurt i mean a lot of people think that bolts are representative of all electric cars. Right. They're like, GM makes it, right? So now they're walking around going, oh, Harold, so your car catches on fire? So I guess that means EVs are bad like I thought all along. And Great. Thanks, GM. Best case scenario, even if people just think that it's the Chevy bolts, you really want to be making what's equivalent to the Ford Pinto? Yeah. Really? It's just pathetic. Yeah, so you saved a few pennies, and now that's what you bought. Right. So Rivian announced last week that they have just closed a $2.5 billion funding round with Ford, led by Amazon D1 Capital Partners and T. Rowe Price. 
Rivian's CEO, RJ Scringe, said, As we near the start of vehicle production, it's vital that we keep looking forward and pushing through to Rivian's next phase of growth. This infusion of funds from trusted partners allows Rivian to scale new vehicle programs, expand our domestic facility footprint, and fuel international product rollout. And now Rivian has confirmed they are looking for a second factory in the U.S. that will include battery cell production. Rivian's existing factory, which is a converted Mitsubishi factory in Normal, Illinois, can produce about 300,000 vehicles per year. As we reported last week, Rivian has, of course, delayed the R1T until September. Delayed. Delayed. Yeah, September. No summer camping trips for me, but we can make vans for Amazon on time. Oh, Great. Gosh. Thanks, Rivian. Where nice. Are you, where are your really nice. Pills. You're supposed to come in June, you but you're not coming you till... Go. Here you go. Uh, fine. Pills again. In more Rivian news... Rivian has announced a partnership with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, or TEDEC. Rivian announced the goal is to have charging stations available at 56 state parks system-wide, depending on the availability of electricity and planned future park upgrades. All right, let's not get too uh, excited here. First of all, these are just level two chargers, you know, something like 20 miles per hour. And second, 56 chargers may be the goal, but my guess is that it'll end up being something like 20 because it says, quote, depending on the availability of electricity and planned future park upgrades. Well, you know, we're planning on redoing the parking lot in a few years, so let's not start these new chargers until that happens, okay? Rivian says they'll be getting site surveys and engineering over the summer with installation beginning as early as fall of 2021 and stretching into March of 2022. But will you really do it then? Hmm? Well, they, they said hmm? that they were going to be stretching into months later. So, you know, that's their MO. So I was scrolling through my news feed on the toilet the other day, as I do. Um, and what a headline do I see? With full self-driving available on demand, be wary of any and all Teslas. With the sub-headline, beware almost any Tesla can now access full self-driving mode. So I had to click on the article to see exactly what the heck Sasha Lakash was talking about. Immediately at the top of the article, I see a correction where it basically says that the entire headline is false. And below it, the updated article still contains factual errors. Hang on. Hang on. I'm sorry. So this is a Mashable article. Yeah. Uh, and then they print the article and then immediately say, update, the article's wrong. No, they don't immediately. It's the day after at 10 o'clock in the morning. So here's what they they wrote the article. She handed it to her editor. The editor was like, oh, that's that looks good. <laughs> Woo! Throw that one out there into the ether. And then the next day they come in, you know, with their coffees. And oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, I guess I'll get to work at 10 o'clock in the morning Pacific time, which is, by the way, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So you've had this out for two days. Um, and they go, oh my gosh, I'm like getting a lot of emails saying that I was completely wrong about my article that I didn't do any research for. I just read some other article and I thought that I knew something and I wrote that thing and you approved it, editor, because you didn't do any of the the background research on it. Wait, but let's go to the original article. What was the thesis that basically if you have a full self-driving car, it's dangerous, so you should be wary of Teslas? So not only is that thesis kind of pretty much wrong on its face. It's entirely it's also, wrong. It's double wrong because not only like you were saying, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Tesla cars don't, you can't. <laughs> I bought full self-driving for my car. Do you need my pills? It doesn't have full self-driving yet. So why are you putting out an article being like, beware, beware of all, all Teslas. Teslas. Okay, but I just also want to point out. Teslas are the safest cars on the road. I mean, which is, I assume is why they had to pull the article because the data doesn't back up. No, no, no. They didn't pull the article. They updated the article with Sorry. a little correction at the top, which didn't change the headline. Okay. And that's ridiculous. I mean, if the entire article is now false, then you should retract the article. It's basically just talking about it's because the whole article was just a load of bull. They had to rewrite the whole thing just explaining what full self-driving beta was and that there aren't that many people. But still, you never know. Do you know how journalism is supposed to work, right? Yeah. You're, you have, first of all, you hire good journalists, which means this article would never have been written. Right. But, but if it did, you come to your editor with, hey, I've got an idea for a story. Here's the idea. And the editor should go, hmm, well, where's your data to back that up? Where's your quote from some expert? Mm -hmm. So forth, which wasn't in the article. Right. Um, and then even if that doesn't happen, even if they come to you with the article fully written, you read through it and you go, hmm, this sounds like a load of crap. Uh, we're not printing it right. until we either fact check this or until things change. Like, but instead, they just... Whoosh, whoosh, 
You threw it out the door. Yeah. Now, which, which proves our theory right. that media companies now just care about clicks because right. why? They're selling advertising. Now, I do want to, if this was on like a blog, you know, if Sasha had her own personal blog and it was just her. Sure. You then know, she can say whatever she wants. She can say whatever she wants. This is a, this is a, Mashable makes $54 million a year. They wow. hire editors. They hire they people like Sasha to write articles for them. Apparently they pay them with real money. I uh, would like to say if you're a Mashable editor, please call us. Please. We'd love to have you on the show. We'd like to ask you what the hell was going through your mind when and you printed that article. Heck, we'd like to just educate you so that way next time you don't print such a boneheaded thing and embarrass yourself. Now, I think they wanted to print it. I think they they got you to click, right? It was probably one of the highest clicking articles right. and they're probably like, Sasha, do that again. Right. Now, I, it's a little confusing. Tesla makes it a little confusing as to what sure. self-driving is, who has it. But when. that's why, as an intelligent journalist, you should do the damn research before you write an article that now confuses people more. And, you know, we have like a whole episode where we talked about Tesla needing a uh, PR person. PR person. Yeah. PR department yeah. would have solved this. Yeah. Because then when the editor said, well, did you reach out to Tesla and talk to the PR department? I'm sure she said, I tried, I tried but no one got back no to me. No one got back to me. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So then the, so then the editor's like, well, right. I guess that means it's true. Right. And that's the problem, Tesla, is that in most cases, if the PR department says nothing, it is kind of admitting that that's the truth. And in this case, there right. is no PR department. And Tesla, you don't have to really like have a super big, just have, just take our email address. Hello at now, you know, channel.com. Put it. In your when you're like when they're like I want to write a thing just make an automated email that says yeah we'll answer if them. you want to talk to the PR department just email hello at now you know channel dot com and we'll be your PR department and we'll set the record straight because honestly I would do it for free yep. if, if you know if Sasha wants to uh, what do you think about I'd be like hey you're wrong on twelve points yeah maybe you should rethink your article so GMC is coming out with a new EV pickup truck this is on top of the GMC Hummer EV and if we count all of the GM pickups this will be the third after the ev silverado now they released this image is that the truck it kind of looks like a gmc sierra well according to a company spokesman it is just a sierra underneath a sheet and it is not at all representative of the final product okay so that's not what the ev truck is going to look like you know as a ghost uh do we know how much it will cost no do we know the range no do we know where it will be built no uh, do we know when it's going to be coming out? Yeah, um, no. Uh, do we know the zero to 60 time? Uh, no. The charging specs? Mm, no. Uh, any of the interior screen layout? No. Would you like me to tell you the details we know? Uh, oh, no. I'm keen to guess. Uh, do we know the bed length? No. Does it have a frunk? Maybe. Uh, do we know anything about the seating capacity? Perhaps. Do we have any details at all about this announcement? Yes. Okay, what is it? It will be a full-size pickup. Will it? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to shoot you. <laughs> so, we don't know anything other than it's not going to look like the sheet, I'm sorry. the ghost I'm sorry. Of the Did truck. Monty Python write this sketch? Are you serious? They don't know anything? And that's not the truck. Right. We know that it's going to be a full-size pickup truck. I mean, maybe that means that it's going to be a big truck. So wait a minute, you put a sheet over a truck that isn't the truck, that means you don't even have a prototype or even a mock-up of the truck, meaning like, yeah, hopefully we'll have a truck. My other question is, if you have, if you're going to come out with a Chevy Silverado, you're going to come out with an EV Hummer pickup, mm -hmm. why do you need a third truck? Well, because you don't understand, GM has all these different brands under it, you know, so they have Chevy and they have like Hummer. But they have GMC. What is GMC going to do? They need I to make I thought it was GMC their... Hummer EV pickup. So well, that's... it is. But... So then why need a third one? Well, because you... If you do. don't even have it. Like, I understand maybe you you develop something and be like, this is cool. It's not the same as the other two. So let's make a new brand for it. But wh why would you come up with something and then cut into your sales? Like, for instance, if I was interested in getting an, a GM pickup truck and now I'm like, hmm, but I'm going to have to wait till this one comes out so before I decide. Well, no, I think... 
that if you're a Silverado guy, you're a Silverado guy. And if you're a GMC Sierra guy, you're a GMC Sierra guy. See, they've already they've already taken all the people and they've put them in these little categories and then they've split them all apart. And they said, oh, you don't want to buy a Ford. Oh, you don't want to buy a Silverado. You want to buy a Sierra. I'm so confused. OK. It, it, it's all about the truck market. You got to do this is how they got to do it. It's probably going to be the exact This sounds same. exactly like we talked about in an earlier story today where it's like when you ask people what they want right. instead of telling them here's a great thing right well, just make a great product <laughs> gm here's what i think is going to happen the ev silverado is going to come out and i'm going to guess that whatever the gmc whatever they're going to call it the thunderbolt uh which would be a much better name than whatever they're going to name it they're going to go like oh it's the same platform no, it'll be the same it's platform. It's the same battery it's and motors, same but it yeah. looks different. It's got a backup camera that's cool looking. All right. A new study by the International Council on Clean Transportation, or ICCT, says only battery electric vehicles, BEVs, and fuel cell electric vehicles, FCEVs, powered by renewable electricity, can achieve the kind of deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from transportation that comport with the Paris Agreement's goal of keeping global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius. There is no realistic pathway to that goal that relies on combustion engine vehicles, including hybrids of any sort. And so that got our attention. Yeah. Uh, and so I wanted to show you this really complicated bar graph that they came out with that shows basically ICE versus BEVs in each region of the world and how much life cycle greenhouse gas emissions in grams of CO2 per kilometer that they create. Now, the reason I'm doing this is so that when you're at uh, your next dinner with your uncle in the corner who's saying like, EVs are dirtier than gas cars is what I heard. Or if they go, well, but you know, a Prius can get pretty efficient. And if you really factor in who's building all the batteries, here is an actual study from the International Council on Clean Transportation, which is going to be a lot better than what I heard. Right. So you can whip out this little clip. And by the way, this is going on our Now You Know Clips channel. So you don't have to share the whole episode. You can just share this story, which shows this chart here. And this is showing that generally less than 100 grams of CO2 per kilometer are created by BEVs and around 250 grams or two and a half times higher for ICE vehicles. Now, if you look at this next chart here, this is even easier. This is something you can just pull out and show them, which shows you all the different kinds of vehicles. And if you look at the one down the bottom there, that's how much CO2 is put out by an EV versus on the left, how much is put out by an ICE vehicle. And you can see it's about five times higher for the ICE vehicle. And that is including everything making the battery, uh, all the lifetime use of fuel and so forth. So when someone says like, I hear they're dirtier, they're not dirtier, right. okay? And, and they're getting cleaner every day. And you have to keep in mind who would be telling you that the that the electric cars are dirtier. Right. It's the fossil fuel industry. It's so easy to confuse people. You just say, nope, they're dirtier. And people go, well, I, I heard that they were dirtier. And just a little, um, I don't know, tip to international councils that put out these kind of reports. Maybe work on your graphs so that the average person can read them and not have to take out like an, a, a magnifying glass and like a you know an appendium to figure out what the heck you're talking about. It shows though how clean EVs are. It does. And, and that th that you need to grab the, your magnifying glass to see how little emissions uh, they put out compared to a regular gas burning car. Yeah. And it's in each region of the world. So it's not like you can even point to one place and go, well, they're dirtier there. They're not dirtier anywhere. So the super heavy booster had a static fire test. Okay, can you slow down a second? Uh -huh. um, I love space, I love space news, but there's so much about space news that confuses me. I thought that Raptors were already done being tested. I thought they were on the um, Falcon 9. They are. Okay, so then why do we have to test them again? Well, they're not. Well, well you they, just said they tested them you're, again. Well, you, listen, you have like, let's say, let's say you put a motor in a car. Yeah. And you know that the motor works. Yep. But if the suspension on the car is going to make the car go, whoa, 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 you know, fall apart like at uh, the end of Blues Brothers, then you know you're in trouble. Gotcha. So what they're testing here the is whole system. super heavy, and, which okay. is so slow down again. What? I know SpaceX moves so fast that I if you're not, up. if you you know got to stop and look around once in a while, you're going to miss it. What's super heavy again? Super heavy is the stainless steel uh, paper towel roll. <laughs> Um, that sits below uh, the Starship, which is that why bullet looking okay, thing. Okay, why can't Starship just do what it needs to do on its own? Why does it need this booster? You need rocket boosters to get the stuff you want in space in space. Oh, okay. So you put Starship on top of this when you need to go further. 
Like, well, just to get it into orbit. Oh, okay, so Starship on its own can't do all it needs to do. It needs this big booster rocket, which is going to be reusable. It's going to fly back to Earth. Yes. Kind of like a Falcon 9 booster does now. Exactly, just scaled okay. up gotcha. a lot. Okay, I'm getting it now. So yes. we did the test, and uh, AV tweeted out, just a quick reminder that these two rocket stages combined will form the most powerful rocket humanity has ever created, and they could be launching this year. Elon said, but much more important is that this design is capable of full and rapid reusability. Long way to go from design to making it actually fully and rapidly reusable with high payload, but at least success is one of the possible <laughs> outcomes. Haha. -ha. So yeah, the, it's not just that it's a big rocket, like the Saturn V was a big rocket. It's going to be a reusable rocket. So not only are you going to spend months building it and then launch it up into space, it's going to come back down and land, and Use so is the other part. And then you can say, oh, you need more stuff in space? Now, I know a lot of you watching right now is this is Tesla time news. You should be talking about Tesla. I don't care about space. Hang on. Even if you don't care about the moon and Mars, even if you're like, I'm never going there, so I don't care. I bet you are planning a trip someday, right? And I bet you're planning to get in an airplane. If you're planning on getting an airplane, then listen up, because this booster we're talking about is going to fly you and your family, I am positive of it, to, on one of your next big trips. And you're like, wait, what? I'm not going to the moon. No, you're probably going to, I don't know, Canada, or you're going to Europe. And when you get into a plane, that's where you go, right? It's coming soon to a rocket pad near you. Is going to be an intercontinental flight. flight. And it'll take 45 minutes to get to the other side of the world. That, and, and I know you're going, wait, I'm not Richard Branson. I'm not Jeff Bezos. Right. I can't afford that. It won't cost $250,000. It'll cost about the flight of a plane ticket. How many places that you want to go are limited by how long it's going to take to get there? Because I really want to go to New Zealand, but I don't want to fly to New Zealand. It's so bad that I won't go to New Zealand if I have to take an airplane. I would have to already be in like Hawaii right. for me to say, well, let's go to New Zealand. But what if you could go to lunch in New Zealand in about an hour? And then come back the same day. Right. That's never, ever, ever, ever been able to been accomplished before unless you were in some kind of either supersonic jet or... Even with the supersonic, supersonic jet. jet. <laughs> but I, mean, but I yeah. mean, people paid top dollar to fly in the Concorde just to get to Europe a little bit faster. Just a little bit. This is not a little bit faster. Yeah. This is incredibly faster. This is what, 22,000 kilometers an hour? You're basically going into space and then coming back down. Right. So I know all of you think this is crazy, but this is just as crazy as when the Wright brothers were inventing their plane that could only hop mm -hmm. and people would go, you know, I bet this could be someday turned into a big tube that would fly people across the ocean. Like, no, no, no. This only <laughs> flies across that little pit over there. I'm sure maybe someday, but only Mr. Rockefeller will be able to afford to fly across the English Channel. Or this is like in the 1700s when you got on a whaling ship and you're like, we're going out, honey, for months at a time to hunt for whales and I may never come back. And then someone saying, you know, I bet someday there'll be a carnival cruise that'll have thousands of people on it and they'll all be partying and listening to, you know, Mel Torme bands. Right. And it'd be like, what? What are you talking about? Right. That could never happen. Right. This is going to happen. And it's going to happen so soon. It's probably going to happen this decade. And it's going to change the way that we live. And yeah, we're getting to see it right now. And it's happening so fast. The iteration with, is amazing. With any other company, it would have taken us We'd be thinking about this. Oh, in 10 years, we'll have Starship. Yeah, I mean, look at this tweet from Alexander. He said, when hop updated aft flaps. And what the heck is he talking about? Uh, he's talking about when is the next hop going to happen with, with Starship. Um, Elon says, flight tests showed that we can make body flaps narrower and lighter. And that's to the point. Because they've been testing so fast, they come up with data so much faster. Instead of taking two years in between each iteration, they just keep testing, testing, testing. And unlike NASA, who has to do everything super safely... He doesn't care if they blow up. Right. Exactly. And so this is the exciting part. We're living through it right now. Like if you're watching this video and the date is today, <laughs> which it is, you're living through it right now. Um, and you could be watching this in the future and being like, oh, wow, they were totally right. Or, oh, yeah. they were totally wrong. Yeah. It'd be like if we had video from the Wright brothers and you could go back and watch it and be like, that's when it was happening. Right. This is happening right now. It's yeah. so exciting. As the Model S and X refresh has rolled out, one of the new features is Smart Shift. So this is where the car decides what direction the driver would like to go by intelligently 
looking around and saying, oh, well, there's a wall behind me, so I think I'll put myself in drive. Yeah, and Tesla seems to have doubled down by removing the stock where the driver would typically select drive or reverse. Well, now it appears the smart shift feature could be coming to the Model 3 and Model Y as well. In a tweet responding to Holmar's catalog, well, let's read both tweets to make sure we get the full context. Holmar's catalog said, made a reservation on OpenTable. My iPhone parsed the confirmation email automatically and added it to my calendar. So when I got in my Tesla, it started navigating to the restaurant automatically. All I need to do was pull the gear shifter and full self-driving took us there. Elon said, you don't even need to touch the shifter in new S. Auto detect direction will come as an optional setting to all cars with full self-driving. So wait. First, does this mean what it seems to mean? Elon did say coming to all cars with full self-driving. So right. does he mean Model 3s and Model Ys? I think. I mean, if the car is going to drive itself, why would you need to put it into drive? I know. That seems like a fun, <laughs> like of all the decisions you're going to make during the trip, like left, right, left, right, right, stop. Why telling it to go is, yeah, a really good point. And then this next point, does it mean that future Model 3s and Model Ys will come without a shifter stock? Or just that you'll be able to choose to use the stock or choose to use auto shifter as an option? It depends on if we're talking short term or long term. Short term, I think we keep the stock because not everyone has full self-driving. Although I figure whatever kind of uh, software that they have in the Model S, you just change a couple of lines of code and pop it into the Model 3. Yeah, because I want to clarify... Um, we haven't talked much about smart shift. Most of us don't have it yet, so it's hard to picture. But there's two modes, right? So while you no longer would have the physical stock in, let's say, the new Model S or X, mm -hmm. you still do have the on-screen swipe if you don't like the automatic mode or if you want to override the automatic mode. Mm -hmm. So if you get in your car and it's like going into drive and you're like, no, 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 I meant reverse, you would swipe to reverse. Right. Now, with the Model 3 having a stock, that means that you don't need to waste screen space with the swipey thing. So it could just be that you'd override it with the stock. In the future, if we're talking long term where these cars are going to be driving themselves, yeah, why bother, you know, injection molding stock components, buying battery components, wiring it all up, putting it into the wiring harness? Like, that's a lot of work. And, and I do want to point out, a lot of people might be like, I need my stock. I need to tell my car which way to go. A lot of people every year put it in the wrong mode themselves and then either drive into a garage or run over somebody because they made a mistake. Humans do make mistakes. And this isn't to say that computers can't make mistakes, but I think what Elon is saying here is why let the human decide if they're not going to be deciding on anything else on their trip? Like we're getting to the point, you got to get this in your mind. We're getting to the point where we're going to become passengers, which is what we want. Like exactly. when you get on a plane, it's not like, OK, everyone strap in. You're each going to get your own controls. And I want you paying attention out the window. Well, what do rich people have? What do rich people have? They have. Oh, chauffeurs. Chauffeurs. So that's kind of where the direction we're going. Right. Like when when, uh, you know, rich people could have refrigerators. What do we have in the future? Everyone has refrigerators. What, what if Elon had called it auto chauffeur? Maybe more people would have seen it as the positive that it is. It's like the car is now driving you around. Isn't this amazing? We want this. Like so many people are like, I don't want it. I want to drive my own car. And it's like, yeah, you can still drive your own car for a while. But why would you want to? Well, also look at rich people. They typically also have their fast car that they take to tracks. Right. And it's funny because a Tesla is both things mm -hmm. at the same time. Yep. You have your track car, which also can drive you around. So yeah. I think it's the direction of the future. So you don't hear this news every day. Tesla has closed a supercharger location. No, I mean, they, they close them all the time for maintenance and stuff like that. Uh, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Uh, no, I mean, permanently closed a supercharger for Tesla owners for charging, like permanently. I mean, where is it? Some little off the beaten path location where no one visits, probably because there no one uses it or something like that. Well, no. I mean, we've been there many times. In fact, we've partied there. Uh, what? Yeah, I'm talking about the first supercharger location in the heart of Tesla. The supercharger located right at the Tesla Design Studio in Hawthorne, California. Oh, right. That's the one that shares the lobby with the Tesla Design Studio. So you like hang out there in the lobby and you're literally just a few feet away from Tesla's like skunk works and stuff. Right. Well, it appears now that uh, due to security concerns, Tesla has been forced to close it starting last week on July 19th. Redditor James F10603 said he spoke with a Tesla employee at the Design Studio and this is what 
he posted on Reddit. I spoke with the leader of the Tesla design studio in Hawthorne, and he told me that he requested the supercharger be closed to the public for security reasons. This was the first supercharger ever built. He also said that he requested it from Elon specifically and that Elon was a little disappointed, but he understands. And I have to be honest, I understand as well. Yeah, I mean, to get to the supercharger, you have to drive these back streets between SpaceX headquarters where they're like making rockets. You can literally see rocket parts strewn all over the place <laughs> right. and you feel like, Am I supposed to Am be supposed here? To, right. Like you're literally 10 feet from a rocket part. Right. Um, and I'm assuming that this was because, yeah, this you really probably shouldn't be there. Like not only the rocket stuff, but the fact that, yeah, this is the Tesla Skunk Works where, I mean, it's called Skunk Works for a reason. They're working like literally behind the partition wall. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, my God, they're working on something big, which right. means you're probably tempted to do something stupid. Like, can I go to the bathroom? Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, we've been there so many times and I've always just been like, what is this doing here? Why yep. is this here? I mean, it was the first uh, I think it was the first version three supercharger. Yep. You know, that's where they showed stuff. But, yeah, I think it should be private it should be for tesla or spacex employees only that work in that area because right, they have like million dollar rocket engines that they're like yeah. running around on uh forklifts and stuff and you're in a car you're yeah. in, and probably you're in a car that can accelerate really fast yeah. so it's like let's just and, and the fact that you're that. allowed into the lobby of this building which is the skunk works right. and there's like a uh, gear that like i think you can buy uh t-shirts there <laughs> right. so it's like while they're going to look for your size and you're like i'm gonna sneak in and look what they're building like yeah not a good idea it's such a it's a, like a vestigial part of tesla it's really yeah. funny but i'm glad that they've they're getting rid of it i honestly it was just too weird so we recently interviewed david fraser hidalgo he's a maryland state delegate and in the interview he talked about how during bill hearings he loves gotcha questions yeah, this is where the opponents of a bill try to catch you off guard with questions like, well, if EVs are so great, why does the government and our hardworking taxpayers have to subsidize them? Why can't they exist without our subsidies? Gotcha. And David says he loves this kind of question because then he can talk about how much our government subsidizes the fossil fuel industry. And it's not just the U.S. Your government, pretty much wherever you live, subsidizes the fossil fuel industry. Yeah, this new report by Bloomberg NEF shows the G20 countries, you know, the U.S., Russia, Mexico, China, India, France, Australia, U.K., Italy, etc. They have subsidized the fossil fuel industry to the tune of $3.3 trillion since the Paris Accord was signed in 2015. Let me say that again. $3.3 trillion handed over to oil and gas companies. Now, you might be asking, how much is... $3.3 trillion. Like, what can you buy with that much money? Well, you could buy enough solar plants to power the entire United States of America electricity grid three times over. So, I'm sorry, you just said three times over. Yeah, so you could take three United States's and power them with solar power for what we've paid in the last six years to oil companies just as their subsidy. Just the subsidy, not... Not the, oh, I went to the gas station nope. and I filled up with the unleaded. Just the subsidies. Just the subsidies. Just the governments giving them money right. for nothing. Now, some countries have been cutting back on their fossil fuel subsidies like Italy and Argentina. Good for you, Italy and Argentina. But other countries have been increasing their fossil fuel subsidies. I wonder which countries that could be. Hmm. Could it be Australia and the U.S.? Why, yes, it is. So the report found that 60% of the fossil fuel subsidies went to the companies producing fossil fuels mm -hmm. and 40% went to cutting prices for energy consumers. Well, I mean, that's that's good. I, I, I mean, I like paying less at the pump. So th that's good to, you know, the subsidies are helping the little guy. <laughs> OK, uh, you're a taxpayer, right? Yes. So where do you think the fossil fuel subsidy comes from? Oh, aren't you the little guy? Well, huh? I thought you liked it that mm. the price of gas was cheaper for you. So, uh, but I just don't see it. You don't see it. So, they, but, they, they did this. They took it out of your wallet while you weren't looking. And then you're like, I love getting cheap gas it's prices. Three dollars a gallon. It's good. So, uh, they, they, so the price of gas is essentially 40% higher mm -hmm. than everyone ever. Uh, you, well, you go to the pump and it says, you know, whatever it says now, which is 
freaking wild. Well, I'm sorry, but go to Europe. Okay. Oh, yeah. Where the price of gasoline is astronomical because they don't have as many of these subsidies on the actual price mm -hmm. of gasoline. And that is a good thing, right? Because it makes it so that you're like, hmm, should I take my car today or my bike? Here in the US, we're like, yeah, take the car. It's so much cheaper. Let me take the giant pickup truck, right. and drive 30 miles to the nearest subway. And here's the thing in the last six years, if we had eliminated the subsidy and the price of gas had gone up 40%, wouldn't more people be thinking about driving the EV right now? Yes, because it's already cheaper with the subsidy to drive an EV. Imagine how much more cheap it would be if gas was 40% more expensive. Or not just gas. Think about natural gas, which a lot of people heat their houses with, or heating oil, mm -hmm. right? All of these things would be so much more expensive. You'd be thinking of alternatives like solar on your roof. Right. Because that, once you put the solar on the roof, is free energy. Free energy. Like, not subsidized free energy. It would just be free energy once you paid for whatever the right. panels. And, and, and here's the thing. Over 500 organizations wrote a letter in June to the United States government demanding that these fossil fuel subsidies stop. You're seeing now the list of organizations. And if we want this subsidy to end, you're going to have to add your name to this list. You're going to have to stand up and say, enough is enough. I want my tax dollars to go to protecting my children and my grandchildren from pollution and climate crisis. Stop making gas cheap. Stop pouring money into the coffers of oil and coal companies just because they have lots of lobbyists. And by the way, why do they have lots of lobbyists? Because we're paying them to have the lobbyists. Like it's freaking absurd. And we could have just, we just could have just built in six years. We could have built three times the the solar energy production that we need we could be exporting electricity exactly. that we get from the sun that le that we can produce with no pollution in the united states exactly. for free every year yep but you know what better to keep the wars going right yeah better to have certain places in the world where all the energy comes from that we need to for some reason build ginormous like skyscrapers in the middle of deserts for that makes way more sense hey and if you want to share this story with someone and you don't want to share the whole show head on over to the now you know clips channel where we've chopped it up into a bite-sized clip for you all right while we calm down eli's going to take it away with the starman report Welcome back to the Starman Report, and tonight we are going to talk about astronauts. In the past few weeks, we have had both Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos reach the edge of space. Now that we have private solutions for leaving Earth's atmosphere, the question is now swirling. Are Bezos and Branson astronauts? If we go by the Webster's Dictionary definition, which defines an astronaut as a person who travels beyond the Earth's atmosphere, then yes, by that dictionary definition, both Branson, Bezos, and their crew are astronauts. But we can't really stop there in this discussion because the title of astronaut means so much more. Prior to the past few weeks, going to space was really only possible for government-sponsored astronauts. Here in the USA, that meant becoming a NASA astronaut. These were individuals with master's degrees or higher who not only passed a highly competitive recruiting process, but they also completed years of astronaut training with the hope that maybe one day they would get their chance to go up to space on a scientific mission. In society, we look at astronauts as heroes, people who sacrifice their time and even their lives to go and conduct space research and experiments to expand human knowledge. Astronauts would spend time in space anywhere from a few hours in the early day of test flights to weeks, months, and in the case of ISS Commander Scott Kelly, a full year. For these NASA astronauts, this wasn't a joyride. It was a mission working five to six days a week, both running experiments, operating and maintaining a space station, and when necessary, responding to emergencies, all while being separated from friends and family for a very extended period of time. With all that these people go through to earn the title of astronaut, are we really going to also give it to people who went into space on a five minute joyride? Would you call someone a sailor because they went on a three-day carnival cruise to Cancun? Because now we live in a world where going to space is no longer connected to merit, heroism, or sacrifice. Simply crossing the invisible line can no longer be the deciding factor for the title of astronaut. Bezos and Branson are not astronauts. They are space tourists. Calling them astronauts is the equivalent in the military culture to something called stolen valor. It's great to see private access to space into our world. And with time, it will become less expensive and many of us will have the opportunity to become space tourists on our own. For myself, I can't wait to join Branson and Bezos as space tourists. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of the Starman Report. And I look forward to having you back for more of the most exciting news in space. 
Thank you, Eli. In addition to the adventures of Starman, Eli also runs the My Tesla Adventure YouTube channel where he has been busy testing the full self-driving Beta 9. So I urge you to head over there and check out his coverage of Beta 9. Link is in the description below. All right, it's time for Into the Future. Escape into the future. So remember how the Boring Company made the Las Vegas Convention Center loop a while back? Mm -hmm. We got all sorts of pictures and videos from it, but people were saying it was kind of underwhelming. What do you mean? They were, oh, it's not long Only enough. Only goes two Things miles? Don't go that fast. And, well, it looks like the Boring Company just extended the loop out to the Hilton's Resorts World Casino across the street. Twitter user Gas Off got these pictures of the loop station underneath the casino. According to them, the tunnel is dug, but not walled yet. However, the station has access ramps to allow people to be dropped off by cars and limousines. Wait, so it's like it's physically done? It's just not prettied up. It's uh, yeah, it's they not haven't, dolled up yet. It's not fixed it. Las Vegas up. And take a look at this map. The stuff that's done is like the blue part. Uh -huh. Not all of the blue part, but just that little bit. Look at how much more to go the Boring Company has in Las Vegas. Yeah. And th they've just you know done the next one. Then there's going to be the next one. Oh, I know. The next one. Each and casino's one. dying to get onto that list. Again, oh my gosh. Again, I just want to work on the casting for the movie, The Boring Heist. Oh yeah. Uh, who are we gonna put in that? Hmm. Comments down below. All right, it's time for Going Green, and this is sponsored by EcoWare, where you can find new designs every week, including our new Jeff Who design, which is doing really well. Um, and we carbon offset the manufacturing, the shipping, and the life cycle of your purchase. We plant 10 trees for every order, and... We help cap a well for every order, which is, current. you know, the well is currently spewing out methane. We help to cap those wells. All right, so get ready to translate. You ready, Jesse? Okay, yes. E P M N P D get M Y. Oh, it's the You got it? Eden Prairie, Minnesota Police Department gets a Model Y police car. You you got it. Yeah. Wow, very good. Yeah, it was a simple uh, out, you know, thing there. <laughs> yeah, Police Chief Matt Sackett said the EPPD is excited to deploy our first fully electric patrol car this week, which will be used for traffic enforcement and various other patrol functions. Based on our research, as well as anecdotes from police departments across the country that have started using them, we anticipate a high level of performance and low maintenance costs from our Tesla Model Y. Now, did you hear that? He said anecdotes from police departments across the country. That means it makes a difference when your police department goes green mm -hmm. and uses a Tesla. They hear about it. Do, 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 yeah. do, 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 they hear about it. And it's getting easier. So if, you know, before, you know, uh, years ago, I remember we tried to, you know, tell our police chief about it. You know, it's back when like, the I Model X came I still keep trying. Out. And we were like, oh, get a Model X, which of course costs, you know, $100,000 plus at the time. Um, now, there are actual police departments that have Tesla police cars, and they're talking about it. And you know, the biggest pushback I get when I talk to police departments okay. is they're like, well, Ford makes the Interceptor series, which is made for police departments. It's super duper awesome with yeah. super awesome super suspension and police things and marketing, stuff. marketing, marketing, marketing. It's really marketing. marketed well to me. Yeah. They have brochures. <laughs> uh, does Tesla have any of that? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. So Tesla, again, if you want to oh make us the gosh. VPs of special operations, oh my, just, we would make the stupid brochures for the oh police departments gosh. with the special I, Interceptor brand. I'd be bleh. like, it's got cop car brakes we would do cop thunderbolt car, that cop car thunderbolt motors came up with, this sounds awesome we, this is the thunderbolt edition right, exactly was the it's the lightning pursuit vehicle yes you know i right off the top of my head right there free for you tesla come exactly. on exactly call me up let's, anyway let's this make is... let's make some brochures let's send them in the mail let's go yeah <laughs> Anyway, this Model Y is the city's first all-electric car out of a fleet of 129 vehicles. All right, it's time for sunspots. So one of the weak arguments propagated by the fossil fuel companies is that wind turbines are bad because the blades aren't reusable. They just throw them away in the landfills and it's going to be wasteful, which completely glosses over the toxic radioactive coal ash ponds, which contain more waste and are more dangerous than anything you can pull out of a wind turbine. And these ash ponds constantly get swept into public waterways from floods and hurricanes that the coal plants that the ash ponds service cause or they just contaminate groundwater every other day because uh many of them 
aren't lined. But now, even that bogus argument against wind is being proven false. World-leading wind turbine manufacturer Vestas, along with Olin, an epoxy producer, the Danish Technological Institute, and the Aarhus University, claim to achieve a full recycling cycle of turbine blades by breaking blades apart into fibers and epoxy resins, recycling both to create new wind turbine blades. And I would really like to see anyone try to turn a coal ash pond back into reusable, I can do it. coal. I, I can do it. It'll only take a million years <laughs> yeah. of pressure and time. <laughs> well, you don't have any of the carbon dioxide in the ash ponds. It's but just radioactive But we just add some coal. That's, we add some coal to it. So please share this video with the misled people in your life uh, by sharing the clip again on our Clips channel. This is a heavy Clips channel yeah. episode. You should get over there and just subscribe because there's so much good stuff that we're constantly pulling and you can just be like, whoop. Yeah. Whoop. Send it off to your to your friends who Liven don't know anything. Account, yeah, you know? it's, <laughs> and if you'd like to have some of your own renewable energy generation, contact our friends at Energy Pal. They are the experts on solar and battery. And when you have questions, they've got the up to the minute answers. Like the problem with solar is it changes so fast mm -hmm. that if you're like, well, I knew all about it in 2013, right. which I did. Uh, now I don't know anything about it because right. it changes so fast. And it depends on your state. It depends on taxes your, yeah, and all, all sorts, sorts of stuff. Anyway, call them up at Energy Pal. They know all this stuff. It's free. And tell them Zach and Jesse sent you and they'll help you get your new system. And they're, they're not even the ones who do it. They find you the right installer and then the installer does the work and they don't you don't get charged anything from Energy Pal. It's amazing. Link down below. All right, it's time for a video contributor story. Who do we have this week? We have our buddy Sean in Anaheim. Wait a minute, this is a BYD bus. Hey, Zach and Jesse. Sean Mitchell here with your youngest subscriber, little Benjamin. Say hi, Benny. <laughs> We're here on an electric bus uh, here in Anaheim, California, leaving Disneyland. You can hear that sweet electric wine. I love it. Uh, no smelly diesel fumes, no annoying diesel engine. So, got some strong regen. Nice slow progression of the regen. Very pleasant ride. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, these BYD buses have 140 miles of charge. The driver says that she loves it because it's very smooth. Uh, she feels like it's a lot more efficient and it's a lot easier to drive. I love it. Thank you, Sean. I love seeing that first person video. And if you want to send us your videos, send them in to hello at now you know channel .com. Um, Make sure you shoot them in landscape. No uh, music in the background and keep them two minutes or less. All right, it's time for the Patreon bonus stories. We've got an investor bonus club story we're doing this week as well. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, VPP and Mercedes. So uh, you're going to want to check that out. If you head on over to patreon.com slash now you know for as little as a buck a month, you can check out all of our bonus stories. All right, we're back from the Patreon bonus stories. And if you want to know why we're looking the way we are, well, you're going to have to watch it. Um, all right, so time for the shout outs. Who do we got this week, Jess? We have Wade P. Harold, Ragnar Sandvik, Keith Allen, Arava Yat Yat Oi, Jamal Howard, Russell Ball, Brian Waynes, Pam Bilyeu, Jeffrey P., Enrique, Sheila, Reinhardt, Brian Reuter, Martin Squibbs, Paul, David Castiles, John Larson, Sergei Zvonok, Henrik Sandstrom, John D. Carson, Mike Setting, Scott Kellock, Eric D. Wade, and Alejandro Dever. Thank you so much for supporting this channel. We can't do it without you. All right, it's time for Elon's Tweets of the Week. And Squawk Square said, just tested my newly installed full self-driving. I was a bit nervous at first, but it did everything it was supposed to do. The media is full of shit talking about safety. Now I just need to figure out summon mode. This is next level shit, Elon. Don't think I'll ever not own a Tesla again. Elon said, current summon is sometimes useful, but mostly just a fun trick. Once we move summon plus highway driving to a single FSD stack, it will be sublime. So I'm glad that he's admitting that it's a sometimes fun <laughs> trick because that is kind of what I'm doing. Cybertruck! Now, what is this we're watching? This, I think, is from that Chinese game, the mobile game of peace oh, right. game thing. And is this a Cybertruck and a Roadster? Yeah. Saving the world? I like the oh, Roadster man. and Stainless Steel. Looks yeah. Looks pretty cool. Um, then Justin Grimble says, basically, and then posted this meme, uh, my kidnapper is returning me after listening to me talk about Tesla for three hours. 
And Elon said, ha ha. I bet many of us have been in that situation. Yeah. Drag Times tweeted, no drag strip required, zero to 60 in 1.99. Elon said, nice. Bitcoin Magazine was talking about the B Word conference that had uh, Elon Musk, Jack from Twitter, and Kathy Wood from ARK Invest this week all together on a live stream. That was pretty cool. Elon said, during this talk, we will sing a cover of The Final Countdown by Europe. Jack said, can I borrow a wig? Elon said, sure, I have a ton. And Kathy Wood said, with so many light years to go and things to be found, I'll supply the air guitars. That's kind of cute. Um, it is. It's fun to see three smart people talking together. And I mean, that's already happened. You can go watch that if you're interested. Blue Origin tweeted out, our astronauts have completed training and are a go for launch. But of course, they might not be astronauts. But anyways, Elon had said best of luck tomorrow. And then after Blue Origin uh, tweeted out basically the landing of the Blue Origin flight, Elon said congrats. Which and is good for him. Very being nice the, of him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Eric Berger tweeted out important update on new Shepard's thrust capability. And this is, of course, Jeff Bezos's rocket. Um, well, OK. Yeah, uh, that Jeff didn't, uh, you know, sanction this, uh, I think. <laughs> um, but anyway. can you buy it on Amazon? That's a good question. And Elon said, nice. Vincent Yu said, Cherokee Nation chief says SpaceX will help tribe members living in rural Oklahoma. Elon said, great to hear. Whole Mars Catalog said Tesla customers all over California are donating their spare home battery capacity to create a new clean energy power plant that will stabilize California's grid. Beautiful. Elon said, this will become very important over time. Take note of this. Mm. Sam Kelly said, you've left me with the most awful quandary, Elon. My Model S is so far and away the greatest car I've ever owned and will ever need. But this plaid, man, it's like something from another planet and I want it. Elon said, Tesla Model S plaid is alien technology. And then Root tweeted out a quote from the B-Word conference that Elon was talking about how there's seriously negative nominal interest rates. What is the world coming to? If you want to learn more, you got to watch Why would you put thing? money in the bank if they're not going to give you interest? He was referring to also inflation. Mm. So, but, but I mean, still valid point. Austin Tesla Club said Tesla solar roofs on new construction just look so good. Elon said also lasts much longer than normal roofs and is able to withstand hail and other medium sized impacts. And then Madan said, dear Elon, please launch Tesla cars in India ASAP. Elon says we want to do so, but import duties are the highest in the world by far of any large country. Moreover, clean energy vehicles are treated the same as diesel or petrol, which does not seem entirely consistent with the climate goals of India. Elon went on to say, but we are hopeful that there will be at least a temporary tariff relief for electric vehicles. That would be much appreciated. He continued, if Tesla is able to succeed with imported vehicles, then a factory in India is quite likely. Yeah. So listen up, Indian government. Yeah. Uh, he's basically saying, if you'll treat us right, we'll move in. And then Elon retweeted a SpaceX tweet. NASA has selected Falcon Heavy to fly Europa Clipper. Launching in October of 2024, this interplanetary mission will study whether Jupiter's icy moon Europa could have conditions suitable for life so yay we get to see another falcon heavy launch with the three landings and, and it'll be paid for this time shooting stuff to europa chris tweeted out the test nose cone for starship via boca chica gal starship operational flights will initially be focused on cargo missions and you can imagine how many starlinks they'll be able to push uphill inside of this so that's a picture of starship nose cone mm -hmm. with the big door on the side yeah elon said more of a pathfinder test actual payload bay door dimensions are still under debate volume is about a thousand cubic meters roomy chris went on to say thanks elon and on the subject of roomy big telescopes but with a twist could starship theoretically return hubble saving the iconic spacecraft from a future destructive re-entry challenges with grapple and securing for return but folks do ask that question a lot Elon said, sure. I would argue, why not just have an orbital museum so you can visit it Ooh, in like operation? Idea. But I do think, you know, you have it on the ground. And then I guess SpaceX could relaunch it. Orbital museum. What a field trip that would be. And then, you could, you know, they'd uh, take out all the scientific gizmos and you could just like, oh, <laughs> oh, I see. That's not how the Hubble works, but. Pernay said Starship equals better future. And Elon said, most people have no idea Starship exists or how large this beast is. Body diameter nine meters or 30 feet is bigger than a 747 or an A380. Starship thrust and mass are more than double Saturn V moon rocket. 
Making life multiplanetary means massive rockets. Gotta be done. Then Adam Claude says, It would be so cool for retired starships or mock-ups to be transported to museums around the world to allow people to see the sheer beauty of this engineering marvel in the future. Better yet, see a launch in real life. Elon said, good idea. They are not easy to move over roads, which is why the factory is close to the launch site. But we will support a museum that wants a prototype if they can take care of transport. And again, you just say, oh, this is the last launch of this rocket. Museum, do you have a big field that we could maybe one time land the rocket in? Oh, I like it. Think of all the roads you wouldn't have to travel on. Elon tweeted out, child seats now. Child seats back in my day. And hey, I can attest to that. <laughs> and then Brandon said, any timeline on the next FSD rollout? Will more early access folks be able to test? I've been anxiously awaiting the chance to test. Elon said, two weeks. So we made a shirt. Two weeks. Get it now. It will arrive in about two weeks. In about two <laughs> weeks. And then lastly, Elon tweeted out, when your phone dies and you take a good look around. Is that from The Matrix? That's from The Matrix. All right. So we had this poll about uh, whether Tesla should open supercharger network to all EVs. And what did people say? Most people said that they wanted it. What? This, that did we said, word it correctly? Uh, they want it? Apparently. I thought everyone was against it. Well, our patrons... By a fair margin, we're for it. Um, the second highest thing was if Tesla is going to open it up to certain manufacturers, I'm cool with it. Otherwise, no. Um, mm. And then a smaller proportion uh, thought that it was going to clog up the network and that these manufacturers didn't pay for it. I'm going to keep this poll going because we're going to probably do our in-depth on this on Friday and I mm. want more data. So if you haven't joined the poll yet, it's at our $2 and above level on Patreon. Go join it because I want to see. I want to see if this numbers hold up. Yes. All right. It's time for community mail time. Community. And Greg sent us these photos of the Model 3 charging in Walnut Creek, California. Greg says, I asked the driver if that was LiDAR, and he said he wasn't free to talk about it, but confirmed that he works for Tesla. So my question is, what the heck is it? Comment down below. Uh, yeah, we saw something similar-ish in like Florida, but this is not Florida. So what's going on? Kerry wrote to us and said, I recently moved from Dallas, Texas to Boston and bought a brand new Model 3. I just recently graduated college and got a job in Boston at the age of 21. I'm a big fan of the show. And thanks to you all. I've been so knowledgeable about all the features and benefits of having a Tesla. I really am enjoying my new car. Thank you, Carrie. That's awesome. Tyler wrote in to say, my wife and I recently visited family in Wisconsin and attended a parade for the small town they live in. One of the companies in the parade had two Tesla Model Xs with custom wraps along with some explosion engine cars and similar wraps. It was so nice to see all the kids get all excited about the cool electric cars with the funny doors. To be fair, so was I. This was one of the last places I expected to see electric cars, let alone some Model Xs. Here's hoping it'll get way more common in the near future. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Tyler. Then Branislav wrote in to say, longtime fan and Patreon supporter here. We're huge fans of your channel and owners of just one car, a Nissan Leaf 2017, 30 kilowatt hour version with over 105,000 kilometers and around 88% battery capacity. They regularly go on long trips. And here's some pictures from their trip they just did where they spotted a neat electric boat. It's ferrying passengers between Obertron and Hallstatt in Austria. And he asked the captain, it has a self-made battery pack that can run for 12 to 14 hours a day. Wow. Thank you. Those are cool pictures. And I love seeing this from all around the world. It is so awesome. Holger from Austria wrote to tell us that the e busy that we reported on a few months ago is now closer to reality. Looks like it's been renamed the X-Bus, and now they've unveiled the prototype. They claim it'll have a 600-kilometer range and cost under 20,000 euros. Lots of different configurations there, too. It's really small. And it looks like it's going to, like, if you break too hard, that it would tip forward. <laughs> I know that they they must have engineered it properly, but I don't, that's just what I'm thinking. Kenneth sent us a picture of the Blue Origin uh, live stream, and he says, Zach, here's your Rivian. <laughs> Very funny, Kenneth. Hilarious joke. Yeah, So what? you can make them for your, <laughs> for your company, buddy Amazon. Jeff, for your buddy Jeff gets the freaking Rivians. Mm -hmm. All right, I see how it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Just to pour more salt in the wounds, RJ Scringe tweeted, steep climb, hashtag Moab. Well, yeah, I would love to do that. You know, I don't care much about a climb unless it's the production ramp. Exactly. And remember, if you want to send in your community mail time stuff, send it to hello at nowyouknowchannel.com. We love getting your pictures and stories. All right, it's time for supercharger reviews. But before we do, let's take a look at a beautiful supercharger. Holger sent this in from Flachau, Austria. And this is right next to the supercharger. Look at all this fun stuff you can do, Jesse. Want to go? Want to go? Huh? Yes, huh? yes, yes, go? yes, 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 yes. I want to go. That's awesome. 
Look at that bouncy thing. I, I've never seen a bouncy thing that looks like that. Why? I, maybe because it looks dangerous? I don't know. It's not dangerous. No, it's not. Hi, Zach and Jesse. It's Scott reporting in from the new supercharger location in Madison, Georgia. Eight new version three stalls opened in April of 2021. One of them has the pull-in type parking. These are located in the parking lot of a Hampton Inn, which has clean bathrooms available 24 hours a day. It is adjacent to a McDonald's where you can get food, drink, and bathrooms. And if you cross the road, which can be busy at times, there are several other fast food and convenience store options. I give this one an eight out of 10. Now you know. Hi, Zach and Jesse. This is Sebastian and Marie-Louise from the Beck and Reed Supercharger here in Switzerland. It's a six stall supercharger and there's two more EV charging places right here. There's not a lot of commodities here. We have the Hotel Zeroes and you can walk in less than a minute to the sea here and enjoy the view. There's also the ferry which will take you across the beautiful four watts that is there. This is it from Beckenried, Switzerland. Now you know. Hi, Zach and Jesse. This is Anna and Carl from Sweden. We are in Enschaffling, an hour north from Stockholm. And we are at the supercharger with 16 stars, version two, 150 kilowatt hour charging. Carl, what do we have here? Well, we got a burger place, um, as well as the Swedish, typical Swedish diner. Um, their toilets, it's pretty good. Yeah, so you can have your meatballs here. I think we give it a 7 out of 10. Now you know. Hi, Zach and Jesse. I'd like to report that Williston, Vermont has installed a new eight stall V3 supercharger. I came in late last night, tried it out. I pulled down 210 kilowatts at peak. So uh, I'm sure if I was at a lower state of charge, it would have been a little faster. There's not much in the area. Uh, got a home two suites by Hilton. Over here, we have a healthy living in an H&R block if you need to get your taxes done. And uh, I don't know, it's got a bank. Ah, not much to see. It's right in the flight path of the airport though. You might get lucky and get some fighter jets that are taking off. Um, that's always a little bit thrilling to watch for the kids, especially. But uh, I'd rate this about a five out of 10 for location but I'd give it about a nine out of 10 for speed of charge. Thank you so much to everyone for sending in those supercharger reviews. You can find all of those supercharger reviews and many, many, many more all on a map over at nowyouknowchannel.com slash supercharger reviews. All right, it's time for new superchargers. What do we got? We got the three stall version three at Orchard Central, Singapore. The 20 stall version three in Salet, Sosan, France. We got the eight stall version three in Verizon, France. Can you hear me now? We got the six stall version three in Braintree, UK. We got the six stall 120 kilowatt in Villach, Ost, Austria. We got the eight stall version three in Somerset South Service Plaza, Pennsylvania. We got the eight stall version three in Palm Beach Outlets, Florida. The 16 stall version three in Chino Hills, California. We got the 12 stall version three in Toronto at Princess Boulevard, Ontario. And it's time for the Patreon giveaway. Uh, if you want to get yourself into this big barrel of fun and maybe win something on EcoWare, in fact, a $30 gift card, uh, then just join us on Patreon. The more you support us, the more chances you have to win. Who's our winner? Our winner is Lean Gatza. Leon Gatza. Leon Gatza. Thank Congratulations. You so much for supporting You're going to get a $30 gift card to EcoWare. And there, that is where we uh, completely design everything with solar energy. We're completely carbon offset. You buy a tea, we plant 10 trees, we cap a well. So that's what we do over at EcoWare. Hey, and I want to talk about 
the Now Let's Review channel, where we've been getting a ton of new e-mobility dev devices like bikes and scooters mm -hmm. and helmets. Um, and you and Ethan do a great job of reviewing them, reporting on them. And this is super important because I think a lot of you out there don't know how much fun they are. Right. Uh, they're really fun and they really are going to, I think, change the world because suburbanites are going to be able to buy these things and actually get to places because let's face it suburbia things are much further apart than the urbanites uh, the, well, the let's the not just bikes people who say you know oh, we should all live in mixed use housing and you know have shops below our thing and live in little but urban even, centers even urbanites i mean urban, oh yeah i i was an urbanite for most of my sure. life and it's like you get around by train or bus those mm -hmm. aren't that fun but i mean a scooter an e-bike like lots of fun well and it makes you want like i'm you know, we're riding around on these streets with no anything for anybody, you know, for just cars. Like, there's not even a sidewalk. There's not anything else. And it's just like, yeah, the more people who want to get on an e-bike, A, you feel safer on a street, even an unprotected street, because you're moving closer to the speeds that, you know, cars are moving. And so... Yeah, you can get through an intersection faster. And they it can see you for longer before they get to you. And all of that, like, they're not going to hit you quite as fast and they rear-end you. Plus, a lot of things we talk about on Now Let's Review are things to get seen better. Better. I mean, we've got some awesome new products that we're talking about, like helmets and lights mm -hmm. that make it so that you can't be missed. Exactly. And that's really the exciting part for me is that we get to bring this. It's a brand new world. I mean, yeah, we've had mopeds forever, but an electric moped that's yeah. silent that you're not. Yeah, we're going to be reviewing the new Segway C80 soon, which is a really cool product. So, yeah, go check it out. Go subscribe because there's going to be so much cool stuff there for you. And hey, I just want to thank everyone that's scrolling by. These are our patrons that support us for five dollars or more a month and we can't do the show without our patrons so if you want to get a little bit of bonus content if you're like not done yet head over to patreon.com slash now you know and support us for as little as a buck a month you'll get our patreon bonus stories we also have lots of other perks so be sure to check them all out and uh, choose the one that you want we'll see you next week now, now you know, know.